The next part of the program will be five minute paper presentations uh, by students and it will be from three different domains, uh, research data management, metadata and curation. The second one, legal issues related to the use of language resources in research. And then the last bit, focusing on resources. Um, each uh, presenter will have five minutes to present and we kindly ask everybody to please stick to the time um, as we will be very strict on that. I will give a minute uh, heads up uh, when it is time for you to finish your presentation. I'm going to share the presentation on behalf of the presenters to allow for uh, quicker transitioning and the presenters can kindly just indicate when I can proceed to the next slide. Right, so the first presenter today will be Amy Izzard and Elena um, Aristal. I'm not sure if uh, Amy, if you're here, I trust you are. You did, yes, you are. You're welcome to start your presentation. Hi, thanks. I uh, just want to say we're not students, it's just general paper presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we're all students and learning new things. <laughs> right, please, uh, you're welcome to go. <laughs> Right, so uh, I'd like to present this uh, paper about the Quest project and the curation criteria for multimodal and multilingual data, a mixed study which we have carried out. Next slide, please. So the Quest project was funded by the BMBF, the German Federal Ministry of Education, and it ran from 2019 till next year. And we have partners in the University of Hamburg, where Elena and I both are. Uh, the Leibniz General Linguistic Center in Berlin, the Archive for Spoken German in EDS in Mannheim, and the University of Cologne. The main aim of the project is, a, is to the increase, maximize the potential for reuse and secondary use of audiovisual annotated language data in the humanities. So uh, one of the things we are doing is creating a web portal for users who intend to deposit or create a corpus. This will provide a knowledge base and also tools which allow users to check their corpora which they want to deposit for conformity against various curation criteria, including metadata. So with quality standards and cr curation criteria, we hope to improve the reusability. So the study which we have written about in this paper was focused on multimodal and multilingual, multilingual linguistic corpora. Um, we wanted to look at the needs of corpus researchers and the obstacles which they encounter when they're trying to reuse or create data for which can then be reused in future by other researchers. Uh, we took a mixed approach. We carried out both a quantitative user survey and then a series of qualitative expert interviews with experts in the areas of multimodal or multilingual corpora. So here's some details on the questionnaire. Uh, we had seven subjects blo subject blocks, which we based on the FAIR principles and the objectives of the Quest project. So general information, information about which languages are present in the corpus, um, transcription and annotation, anonymization of corpora, metadata, access, as in how you can get access to the corpus, and then some general information about the people carrying out the survey. We had a mixture of multiple choice questions, free text input questions, and then for each section of the questionnaire, we had a comment section at the end, so people could add extra comments, which we hadn't specifically addressed in our questions. So here are just some quick statistics on the people that carried out the survey and what kind of corpora they were working with. We, only, we had uh, 44 participants um, and they answered a different number of questions depending on the answer to the previous questions. So between 23 and 53 with an average of 35 questions. Participants on the survey came from 13 countries, um, most of them in Germany. Um, most were employed by universities, but also by data centers, companies and archives. Uh, the corpora which they were talking about contained more than 30 different languages. Uh, these were multimodal corpora, so 84% had audio recordings, 41% had video, and 36% had translations, which is more important for the multilingual corpora, um, and 88% of the corpora provided metadata. The expert interviews, uh, we carried out qualitative semi-structured interviews, trying to get deeper insights into the experience and needs of the experts. We based the interview topics on the survey with three key sections and we carried out 20 interviews each of 45 to 60 minutes. 
and they were on annotate the sections were annotation and transcription format standards of metadata and then obstacles and challenges. Yeah, and just a quick overview of the conclusions. So combining the results from the survey and the expert interviews, recommendations were that corpus documentation is absolutely crucial and you should keep detailed descriptions of every stage of corpus creation. Uh, metadata should be published and in standard format. You need to refer to standards and best practices in the field, standardized transcription formats, and for multilingual corpus particularly, it's good to have translations into a widely known language. Common obstacles are that it's difficult to discover and follow different national, international rules for data protection. And when you're dealing with multimodal corpora, the storage of large amounts of video and audio data can be difficult both in terms of cost and in terms of finding long-term storage. So this is me and Eleanor, and we will be happy to answer any questions in the breakout room at the end of this session. Thank you so much for keeping to the time perfectly. Uh, the next presenters uh, will uh, uh, present is um, Anne Feger and uh, Daniel uh, Jetka. Anne, you're welcome to go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Daniel is also here with me and we will answer questions together afterwards. Um, so uh, we want to talk about the seamless integration of continuous quality control and research data management in indigenous language resources. Can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So the main point that we um, want to um, talk about is uh, how this seamless integration of uh, various control measures helped us um, to um, enhance acceptance of the method uh, of, of the measures. Um, the different. Oh, can you please go back for one second? Thank you. <laughs> um, so the quality control measures are um, the copper services that I'll link later. Um, there are different quality um, checks and also fixes um, to the data. And um, the data we're talking about here um, was created in the project INEL. Um, it's transcriptions of endangered languages um, in the Russian, in the area of the Russian Federation. Um, and um, we already uh, talked about this and also about the version control um, that we used in the project, which is the project, uh, which is the software Git in this case. Um, but we what we want to highlight here is how we integrated it into another. So when you work on the data and create a corpora, you don't um, have any differences in your workflow, even though you have the quality control measures and the version control. What was important is that we used continuous quality control. So we didn't um, start to check the quality of the created data in the end or before publishing, but during the creation of the data. And uh, we noticed a big difference because we didn't start out this way, but um, uh, added the continuous control during the project. Um, and it was a big difference in the time needed for the manual fixing of the data and also in the time needed for to prepare the data for the publication. So how we did this is we um, had the whole um, data creation workflow using the version control Git. Um, we did this by using a simplified Git solution called Llama. Um, and then uh, we added the corpus services, checks and fixes using automated Git scripts. So the existing data creation workflow wasn't changed. Okay, next one. This is... Um, how the setup looks like. One of the bullets would be um, one state, how the corpus data uh, in the project would look like at a certain point of time. Um, so uh, every researcher did, for example, transcriptions or annotations and then um, added them to the main repository in Git using the Llama script. And then uh, the Copper Services tool uh, was applied using automated Git scripts that we called Cubo for curation bot uh, scripts. Um, yes, and um, all these um, tools um, were published on GitHub. Uh, I'm going to send the link for this then too. Um, and besides the different fixes that were done to the data, for example, um, 
the deleting of doubled white spaces. We also created different statistics and reports during this. Okay, and uh, here are the different links um, to the different tools that we uh, used in this uh, workflow and created. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay, how much time did I use now? I think maybe I will. Yeah, you've got 40 minutes. seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Then uh, there's just the contact slide on the next and you can ask further question afterwards. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, then we can go to the next presenter, um, which uh, is a group of presenters on flexible metadata. And I think it will be Slava that will be presenting. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Slava Tikhanov, and uh, I'm from Dance. So I'm going to tell you about our work related to uh, common framework in Dataverse and CMD use case. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, before I will start, uh, I, uh, I will try to tell you something about context. And it's quite a big challenge for us because uh, communities usually want to find their specific resources with uh, domain-specific control vocabularies. But as archive, uh, we also want to foster a cross domain search and uh, data reuse. So basically, there are different things uh, on our plate, and uh, we have to find balance how we, we um, can, can find a solution can, that can fit both goals. So we are working on platforms and microservices uh, with APIs, and our basic platform is Harvard Dataverse that was extended with additional functionality on infrastructure level. And now we have semantic API and uh, we also contributed external control vocabulary support. And we started to use knowledge graph uh, for a solution of this problem. Can you go to next slide? So we defined five different challenges for this work. So challenge number one. So we are working together with a uh, client community on the proposal of course set for CMD metadata, and it should be a recommendation for all clearing centers. And basically it will allow, it will allow us to create so-called citation block that will allow also to distribute metadata and to, to share in, in a fair way between all clearing centers. And uh, challenge number two, uh, we are extracting CMD metadata and transforming metadata fields into Dataverse. So basically we already have a working prototype with a CMD fields. And uh, also, uh, we managed to connect uh, external control vocabularies so people can use Wikidata and control vocabularies from Cosmos. And basically, uh, there is a really nice way to get all metadata uh, in a linked open data cloud. And next challenge, uh, we started to build workflow for prediction and linking concepts uh, from external control vocabularies to CMD metadata values. It looks promising because we started also to use some artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, basically, this work uh, is in the beginning, and it's highly experimental. But because we are using knowledge graph, it can uh, lead to great results in the future. And of course, uh, after we, we got uh, pro appropriate uh, control vocabulary support, we started to investigate how to find uh, another con uh, fair control vocabulary available for community. And uh, this work uh, we had in collaboration with NDE, Dutch Network of Terms. And also, it can lead to great results for the all community members. And last challenge, after we have, um, after we will get everything in, in Dataverse, of course, it's necessary to get all stuff back, export it to CMD. And this is the work that we do together with Humanities Cluster from Amsterdam. Can you go to next slide, please? Yeah, so um, to visualize and analyze uh, all uh, our results, uh, we started to use open source framework for business intelligence called Apache Superset. And we started build, to build uh, nice visualizations and dashboards. And basically we are able to visualize any uh, field on these nice charts. And uh, we are also able to get new insights. And uh, it's so great that, that we can even query this solution and uh, we can get uh, keyword search visualized and uh, other interesting uh, functionality. So if you're interested, I will put a link. I have really long presentation for 50 slides. And uh, if you're interested, you can check it here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lava. Um, then uh, the next part of our presentation will now move towards um, legal issues related to the use of language resources and research. and 
um, our next uh, presenters is a group of presenters, um, and Alexei will lead us through that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, basically, what I'm going to discuss is a broader framework, what we have been doing. When we started, actually quite many years ago, this work at Click, then we dealt separately with intellectual property, with copyright. Uh, then at a certain point, we switched to um, personal data protection. And, and basically what this Click is doing, to some extent, it's like an invisible part of language research. So, so basically it's like certain, certain rules which need, which need to be followed. And um, uh, the, the, current, the current paper actually uh, tries to integrate intellectual property and personal data protection because um, from, from like uh, educational point of view, they're like different disciplines. But in real life, when you're managing and working with language resources, then you have to integrate them. And, and, and here during, in, in this paper, actually, we um, selected uh, three separate topics. And, and um, the, the reason why we selected them is that in a way they contradict each other. And, and first, first aspect which we, we concentrated on was data minimization and attribution right. Just to explain, just to explain where the problem lies is that from GDPR or general data protection regulation, uh, the general data protection regulation provides that um, controller or the person who works with data has to minimize the data. Basically, the principle of data minimization says that uh, you have to use the data as little as possible. You have to use the data as little as possible. And at the same time, Bern Convention, um, it's called Copyright Convention, says that when you are using someone's material, some original work, then you have to attribute. You have to acknowledge the authorship of the person. And, and in, this, in this case, actually, we have conflict between GDPR, which says that you have to use as little data as possible. And at the same time, we have uh, international obligations and, and also European Union law, which says that when you're using someone else's intellectual creations, then you have to attribute. And, and, and our ana analysis concerns how to, how to to combine these two requirements, which actually could seem at first, they seem the opposite. And our preliminary conclusion is that, of course, we continue this work. Preliminary conclusion is that actually, even though from first point of view, these principles seem contradictory, they are not. And, and basically, when you're using material, which is someone's creation, then you have to attribute. It's based on, 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 on case law, it's based on regulatory requirement, and actually it's also acknowledged by GDPR, which says that uh, uh, you are allowed to process personal data when you are doing it for compliance with a legal obligation, and there is legal obligation to um, attribute. The second, the second uh, topic which we, what we investigated is that uh, how we can um, make compatible this access right, which is basic, one of the basic rights um, coming from the GDPR, it says that actually data subject, the person whose data, like language research or someone else is processing or using, has uh, the right to access this data. And, and the question is that how far this access uh, right goes? Because usually there is no dispute when um, and the data subject or the person whose data is processed uh, wants to access raw data. But when uh, this raw data is developed further, uh, something is created based on this data. And the question is that how far this access right goes. And uh, uh, this case law on the European Union level, it's actually it's not- One minute warning. It, it's not so clear. Basically it says that uh, uh, sometimes it allows access, sometimes it's no. But our conclusion is uh, that, our conclusion is that, uh, that uh, you don't have, this data subject doesn't have the access to derived data. And the last one is that how to reconcile personal data protection and freedom of expression. Basically, data subject uh, has many rights, has many rights, but at the same time, um, like other members of society have the right of its expression. And we investigated the uh, freedom of expression in research field. And the question is that how to distinguish real like legal basis from GDPR for doing research and how to distinguish legal basis or freedom of expression and, and, and how to find the balance. 
And I think that here I would stop and we can discuss this topic further. Thank you. Thank you so much for sticking to the time. And now we move into the next session, which is um, uh, would, uh, it's about less is more. And Rosalba, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will speak on behalf of my colleagues, Silvia and uh, Hank, uh, that are here. And our paper is focused on the steps that are needed in order to deposit multimodal language archives into European infrastructure with a particular attention on archives of uh, vulnerable people. Um, in particular, our main issue is um, to define a protocol for the curation and dis uh, dissemination of speech archives of vulnerable people which appear to have the highest restriction on curation and dissemination uh, themselves. In fact, uh, data collection of people with communication or mental disorders are not easy to obtain. Mm, therefore, mm, our aim is to find a balance between the right of the recorded people and recorded heirs uh, with the right of access to information for research purposes and preservation of memory. Uh, in this respect, um, can you go on with the slide, please? Um, the DELAD initiative aims specifically at uh, addressing some of this question. DELAD, that stands for Database Enterprise for Language Speech Disorder, has uh, one of its main goals um, uh, to help in sharing corpora of disorder speech in a GDPR compliant way and in depositing them in secure repositories in the clearing data centers. Uh, we, uh, as a University of Siena, decided to join DELAD in order to um, offer the research community some material coming from the Arezzo Neuropsychiatric Hospital Archive, uh, can you go on, that now is uh, the University of Siena. This archive uh, is of particular interest because it contains different linguistic material of people affected by mental disorder, both in written and audio documents of unmonitored speech. Uh, this archive is very rich in documentation and it offers multiple types of data and also a different population sample. It comprises around 1.5K elements, including files, registers, envelopes, notebooks, and filling cabinets. And one of its sub-collections is represented by the recording of the interviews collected by the historian Anna Maria Bruzzone with the patient of the Arezzo Mental Hospital in the 70s, along with the associated transcription. Additionally, um, the core of the archive consists in the medical records of the patient. And these records contain patient personal files uh, some, uh, that in some cases were directly written by the patient themselves, such as private correspondence, poems, uh, drawings, diaries, and uh, autobiographies. Um, in this respect, the diary of a former patient is of particular interest, uh, and it was uh, preserved by a psychiatrist who worked at the hospital, and it was loaned to the archive at the university. The, this diary is typewritten, paginated and bound by the author himself, and consists of 300 pages. Uh, thanks to the medical records, now we have uh, some personal information about the patient. Uh, nevertheless, all this heterogeneous material poses several problems in the management, the metadata creation, and conservation. And for this reason, uh, with DELAD, we started a feasibility study for storing and archiving the linguistic material of the Arezzo Neuropsychiatric Hospital into the language archive at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistic in Nimegen. Um, at this moment, can you go on, please? Um, at this moment, we have started to address problems related to um, metadata profile. In fact, the language archive uses the CMDI framework for its descriptive metadata. Yeah. But nevertheless, given the peculiar nature of the Arezzo archive, it is crucial to select the appropriate metadata component and profile from the existing set of metadata. Uh, in this respect, we need to consider at least three crucial issues. That is the heterogeneity of the archive, given that we, uh, we deal with different material, not only oral interviews, but also written specimen of um, patients. And in this case, we think that it is more advisable to consider granularity, that is combining components in order to cover just one 
at that time and modularity in order to create a set of metadata that um, can be suitable for other um, resources at the same time. And the second issue to take into account is the peculiar nature of the archive, because we are creating a profile for a corpus that is suitable only for restricted assets uh, with uh, sensitive data such as medical diagnosis. And at last, we have to consider the historical nature of the archives that make it necessary to deal with uncertainty. That is, for some patients, we don't have the full information, whereas for others, we have. So uh, maybe mm, we need to offer a flexible metadata profile. At the end, we hope that uh, at the conclusion of the work, uh, further study will be undertaken in order to access the feasibility of accessing currently restricted data. And we hope that TELAD will assist in ensuring compliance to the GDPR guidelines for data protection, transparency, accessibility. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, then we move to our final part, which is on resources, and Daniela Miro will lead us into the final um, presentation of this session. Let's see if Daniela is available. There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. In this presentation, I'll talk about a corpus of uh, Italian spontaneous speech called the Dia Corpus Dialogic Italian. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, recently, the interest in speech sciences for spontaneous conversations has increased and researchers have begun to study the characteristics of spontaneous and casual speech in different languages, such as German, Dutch, English, French, and Czech. This kind of research has been driven by the creation of spontaneous speech corpora that allow the systematic investigation on large amounts of data. For research of this kind on Italian, the available resources, that is corpora of spontaneous speech that, that are also suitable for phonetic research are very limited. Although researchers interested in the study of spoken Italian can access several corpora, these resources are not always suited to be used for acoustic analysis. Next uh, slide, please. Um, this presentation has the goal to present a new corpus of Italian spontaneous speech called the Corpus, suitable for acoustic phonetic analysis, and to reflect on the best practices for making this corpus available to the scientific community and archiving it in a safe and long-term way. Just a few information on the corpus. Next uh, slide, please. Dia Corpus is a representative of Italian spoken in the town of Bolzano. Bolzano is characterized by the presence uh, of a bilingual Italian German community, which means that uh, Italian is spoken both by Italian native speakers and Tyrolean native speakers. The speaker sample is made up of 40 speakers that represent different types of speakers in terms of language competence and social characteristics. Next slide, please. Data collection sessions were composed of three different parts, a dialogic interaction in pairs between people who know each other well, a questionnaire on social networks, and the reading of a list of sentences. Each session lasted approximately two hours for each pair of speakers, and it was recorded with a Zoom recorder using uh, headset microphones. These strategies have made it possible to obtain spontaneous speech with high acoustic quality. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, overall, the the corpus is made up of approximately 30 hours of speech, around 10 hours of spontaneous speech, 19 hours of speech from the interviews about social networks, and around two hours of reading speech. Currently, only the spontaneous speech data have been orthographically transcribed, and this consists of around 100,000 tokens. A first orthographical transcription of the audio files has been created using the YouTube subtitle transcription system. This kind of transcription has been then manually checked and corrected. Audio files with their corresponding orthographic transcriptions have been processed in web mouse using the tools of forced alignment, automatic segmentation, and labeling of speech signals. The output of this process is an audio file with a time aligned transcription file containing an orthographic transcription at the world level, a phonemic transcription, and a phonetic segmentation. The result has been then manually corrected. At present, four minutes for, of spontaneous speech for 18 speakers were phonologically segmented and corrected. It is more than 70 minutes. Next slide, please. Once the data were phonologically um, segmented and annotated, we used a speech database 
management system, the collection of software tools offered by the Bavarian Archive for Speech Signals. EMU allow um, to create, manipulate, query, and analyze speech database through HAR. Um, to sum up, uh, up to the moment, the corpus consists of data which are almost all in archive format. And uh, um, next uh, slide, please. The next steps are devoted uh, to the long-term preservation and accessibility of the corpus. Yeah, thank you. In order to archive the corpus in a clearing repository, a number of processes still need to be addressed. addressed. Records metadata has to be transformed into one of the accepted profiles. Informed consent with permission to share data from the participants must be obtained and audio files must be anonymized. If you have any advice on how to achieve these goals, I would be grateful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, all the speakers of the session.